Hello everyone. We'll see now what is jaw relation, also known as maxillo-mandibular relationship. It is the relationship of maxilla with that of mandible. That relationship is also called jaw relation. It's a very important step to know for fabrication of complete denture or for example fabrication of fixed partial denture or removable partial denture. Jaw relation is a topic which is must to be clear with every dentist's mind. Coming to introduction, maxillomandibular relationship is defined as any spatial relationship of the maxilla with that of the base of the skull or to that of maxilla to that of the mandible or any of the infinite relationship of the mandible to that of maxilla. Basically, it is all about moving the relation of mandible, maxilla and base of the skull. This is all about what is jaw relation. It is a relation of the jaws. So coming to the first one, there is orientation of jaw relation. Actually, jaw relation is based on three different parts. Orientation jaw relation, vertical jaw relation and horizontal jaw relation. Before going to orientation jaw relation, we need to check certain few things for which governs the orientation jaw relation. So the first thing that governs is the labial fullness. What is labial fullness? Labial as mean the labial part. Fullness, matlab fullness of this particular section. So what that does mean? If our denture is thick enough, this will be protruded out. We can see in the picture as that of the third one. If this denture base is very thin and the rim which is there is very inside, this will not be full. This will be having some depression that is also not acceptable aesthetically. So, labial fullness is one important section and point that is to be checked in a complete denture fabrication as well as most important point for the jaw relation. Second is the height of the occlusal rim. We know there are several factors which governs the height of the occlusal rims. Like for example, in maxillary, the height of the uh, occlusal rim should be not above the it should not be above more than the one third of the stensons duct or it should be parallel to the a la tragus line will come to that and also for the mandible for example it should not be more than two third of the retromolar pad for example in the anterior region it should not be more than that of the lower lip for maxillary anterior region it should be little visible around 0.5 mm in the physiologic rest position and while in phonation it should be 1 to 2 mm visibility should be there even in a smile should be visibility should be present Coming to the anterior plane, now why is this all important because now initially when there was teeth in the patient's mouth, so when there was teeth, there was this ridge, there was a teeth which was supporting this particular labial place, the labial fullness was there. Now when the teeth and the ridge has resolved and the teeth has been extracted out or fallen down, now the place has been taken over with the denture base, the wax rims that we are going to give and the teeth, artificial teeth that we are going to arrange on the occlusal rib. So that has to reciprocate the same as that was with the natural dentition. Coming to the anterior plane, how about a denture which is in the front goes down like this. It is unacceptable aesthetically because when he smiles, you can see a cant. Cant is what? Cant is something which is away from the parallel. Whatever is not parallel, that is cant. If it is not parallel, if it is like this, that is cant. So cant is not acceptable. So now we have to have some reference point which will determine the height and the uh, plane of the anterior region. So the reference point is interpupillary distance or the line. Now this interpupillary line that you draw over here, you place a scale over there and you see that scale is parallel to that of the wax rim anteriorly. So that is to be maintained in the anterior plane. Coming to the posterior plane or the anterior posterior plane that will be determined by two factors. One is a line which will be drawn from the ala of the nose to the tragus middle or the upper part of the tragus. A line drawn, put a scale, hold your fox plane and see if this is parallel to the wax rim which is fabricated posteriorly. Now why is this important? Now, number one, first reason it is important because this gives the relation of the maxilla to that of the base of the skull, which is important for us. Secondly, every one of us know that there are compensating curves in a natural dentition. Now, the natural dentition is gone. 
Now we are going to fabricate an artificial dentition. So we need to reciprocate those compensating curves in that of the artificial denture. So those are anterior posterior curve of Wilson, curve of speed. So all those are coming from down and going upstairs, right? From the canine tip, it is going towards the retromolar pad, middle of the molar, retromolar region and from the middle of the condyle it is passing out. So now that curve has to be maintained. So that curve goes up. So we have to have something which is parallel to that, near about parallel to that. So we have this allotragus line. In US, it is known as the camp, uh, Bromel's line. In UK, it is known as the Campus line. Coming to the guidelines that we need to follow. The center line or the midline. So now how will we decide the center line and the midline? The central line or the midline is decided by the interbro mid distance. What is interbro? This end of the bros, middle of the bro, when you cut a line which passes from the middle of the filtrum almost in all patients, and that line which will go to the down of the dentures, you are supposed to mark in the back ribs. Those will be called as the midline. Coming to the high lip line, what is high lip line? If the patient has a habit of smiling high, like the highest smile when the patient is giving the dentures gingival portion that is a pink portion of the denture should not be visible that will give appearance of a gummy smile so we need to keep in mind that if a patient has a high smile line the denture teeth that we are going to give should be more in the inciso gingival direction so the height of the length of the teeth should be more rather than the width of the teeth Coming to the canine lines, so we are supposed to mark the, we are supposed to ask the patient to smile the maximum he or she can and mark those lines onto the wax rim. So once you mark those lines on the wax rim, that will reciprocate the high lip line. Low lip line in the normal smiling position like this, then you ask the patient to smile normally and then you mark, that is low lip line. Till low lip line, it is mandatory to keep your teeth length. Coming to the canine lines, how will you mark for the canine lines? Now the canine lines are marked when you ask the patient to be normal and from the corner of the mouth you put your instrument inside and wherever it is marking, mark that line, that will be your canine line. Same you do with the other side of the end of the rhino oris, that is this corner of the mouth. So you put your instrument from the corner of the mouth and then you mark a line on, on the maxilla and that on the mandible. That line will be called as the canine lines. Coming to orientation, jaw relation. Orientation. Something we are orienting to. What are we orienting? What are we orienting? How are we orienting? And why are we orienting? Three questions always to be asked to yourself. What are we orienting? We are orienting the mandible to that of maxilla. But how will we do that? We have to do the base of the skull is equal to maxilla. When you are doing parallelism of allotragus to that of the maxillary wax rim. Now maxillary wax rim and the mandibular wax rim should be again contact to each other. So that means again those are parallel. So like for example A is equal to B. So B equal to C. That means the A is equal to C. Same way if we are doing mandible equal to maxilla and maxilla equal to base of the skull. So that means we are relating the mandible to the base of the skull basically. So that exactly is what orientation jaw relation. Orienting your maxillary plane and your mandibular plane to that of the base of the skull. How do we do that? We will do that by the help of a device. A caliper like device which is called a face bow. So what is face bow? So face bow is defined according to GPT-8 as a caliper like instrument which records the spatial relationship of the maxilla to that of the base of the skull with a fixed reference point. It has to have some reference point where it will take the reference point with that of the base of the skull and that reference point and this particular relationship is to be transferred into the articulator. And with that transfer of the articulator, you are supposed to mount the cast. So that exactly is the definition according to GPT-8 which says it's a caliper-like instrument used to record the spatial relationship of the maxilla to that of the base of the skull with the help of a reference point to transfer to the articulator to mount the cast in the same relationship. Now the face bow can be of two types, kinematic and arbitrary. As the name very well suggests us, arbitrary is that which is arbitrary, a random. Now, kinematic is something which is exactly recording hinge position. What is a hinge position? 
hinge position is that position or a that line. It's an imaginary line again, of course. It's in that prosthodontical imaginary line which passes from the center of rotation of two condyles. So from where the condyle is supposed to rotate, that line is called the hinge axis. So the one which will record the hinge axis truly, the true hinge axis recorder is kinematic and which will record arbitrarily somewhere nearby is called the arbitrary phase book. Now the arbitrary phase book is again of two type, fascia type which attaches to the face and earpiece type which goes into the external auditory meatus. First we will see what is an arbitrary type and how do we record that. So arbitrary type of phase bow is recorded in two ways. One is earpiece phase bow. You can see this is an earpiece type of spring bow. Waterpick is a company which produces this kind of spring bow which goes and attaches to Hanau articulator. Hanau H2 articulator wide view con to type. And uh, this is an arbitrary kind of phase bow which is going to earpiece. You can see there is this uh, front portion which is seen that is a U fork. You can see there are some knobs which is to be a titan. There is an earpiece which is going directly into the external auditory meatus, expecting it to be the arbitrarily the hinge position from where that hinge axis passes. Then there is some reciprocating fox that is which goes and attaches to the maxillary rim which is inside which is supported by the patient. So you take those fox, those are these kind of U-shaped fox, you take those fox and you put it in the maxillary rim and attach in the maxillary rim along with this entire setup in the patient. Now that is how the phase bow is recorded. And with the reference point, now what is the reference point here? The reference point here is the orbital, the external or here orbital is there, inferior orbital notch. This inferior orbital notch is marked and the orbital marker, you can see there is an orbital marker that goes and stitches over here. So once that touches over here, that means our reference point is fixed. And then you can transfer this entire setup into the Hanau articulator where there is an orbital indicator where this orbital marker and that orbital indicator should coincide. So this is how an arbitrary phase bow is measured and if it is of fa uh, fascia type. So fascia type where you will mark it? So fascia type is 13 mm in front of the external auditory meata that is called the Bregon's point. So Bregon's point where you will mark the fascia type of uh, kind of arbitrary type of phase bow. Coming to kinematic phase bow, now this has got too much of setup. So that's the reason this is not used so much. Now this uh, kinematic phase bow has got clutches. Now those clutch is a clutch kind of thing which goes and attaches to the mandibular wax rim. Now this mandibular wax rim along with the clutch is placed inside and you ask the patient to do rotatory that is opening of the mandible and more opening of the mandible that is translatory movement. Once this rotatory and translatory movements are happening there is a styli which here has a paper point where it marks the rotation and the translation of the movements. So there is a marking constantly going on here as the patient is moving the mandible. So that marking, the center point of that will denote us the hinge axis, the exact hinge axis of the patient. So that's the reason it is called kinematic kind of phase bow, whatsoever phase bow you are using. First important thing is the anteriors should be parallel to that of the interpupillary line and the posteriors should be parallel to that of the campus, bromels or alacrigus line. So this was all type of phase bow, arbitrary phase bow, facial type and uh, that of earpiece type. The one you can see over there is the earpiece type. You can see the two white color nylon earpiece kind of thing. You have bite forks both for max, uh, edentulous arch and for dentulous arch to record because Facebook can be recorded in any patient because every patient will has his orientation with the base of the skull. Teeth is present or not present doesn't make a difference. Now when are we supposed to use the Facebook? Are we supposed to use in all the cases? No, not exactly. Because you're supposed to use in those patients where the cusps tip are very prominent you're going to record a balanced occlusion where you're going to plan for a full mouth rehabilitation of the patient where the centric relation and the centric occlusion is not supposedly to be matching or supposedly to be matching but is important to us most important where centric relation positions are important to us in those cases we are supposed to mount the rims and the denture base along with the cast into the articulator 
with the help of Facebook. Now coming to this was all about orientation jawlation. Now we have oriented the entire cast, the maxillary cast to the articulator. Now where are we supposed to put the mandibular cast? So for that we need to know what are the heights of the rim which is to be kept final. So to know the height of the rim, now that is called the vertical dimension. So vertical jaw relation is all about, it is saying that the vertical jaw relation is that jaw relation which determines the vertical height present in any patient comfortably. That is in physiologic rest position, the vertical dimension at rest and vertical dimension at occlusion. So vertical jaw relation will be based on that two things which I said. That is vertical jaw relation at rest position and vertical dimension at occlusion. So based on these, we will find out what is the entire vertical dimension the and both occlusal rims will have after occluding maxillary as well as mandibular. Now to do this and to record this vertical jaw relation, there are different techniques. The first methods are called mechanical methods because it is using some mechanical measurements. Second is called physiologic methods because some physiological process or activity or function is going on to record this vertical dimension. Coming to the mechanical methods. Mechanical method, the first ridge relations. Based on some ridge relations, some different scientists came up with different techniques, different methods to find out the vertical dimension at occlusion and rest. So how was that? So distance from incisive papilla to the mandible incisor. We all know that whether resorption occurs, doesn't occur. The incisive papilla is a stable landmark. So from incisive papilla to that of the edge of the maxillary central incisor is 6 mm. So the overbite and overjet that we have is 2 mm. Earlier it used to say 2 mm. Overjet now we have is 1 to 1 1.5 mm. And that case of overbite is only 0.5 mm according to the new book of voucher, Zab Bullender. Now, this distance from the incisive papilla to that of maxillary central incisor was 6 mm. That is final conclusion. And the overjet, maybe we take it 1.5. So the distance from incisive papilla to that of mandible central incisor should be 6 minus 1.5, so around 4.5. Coming to the parallelism of the ridge. Now, ridge parallelism is also of utmost important. That is, we know that if the ridges are not parallel, they will not occlude or both the wax rims will not occlude with each other in one plane. Also, once also if it is occluding, there is something called Christian Chin's phenomena. That is, when we are protruding our mandible and keeping H to H relation till we are in a skeletal class 1, there will be a posterior separation of 5 degrees. So that is called Christensen's phenomena. So that Christensen's phenomena should be there and provided that both the wax rims will be in contact to each other when it is in normal class 1 relationship. So that is called ridge parallelism. The next is measurement from the former denture. If the patient is already a denture wearer, that is a boon to us. How is that boon to us? Because we already know the measurements from that particular denture and we can assess that denture if it has worn down. So that means we can increase the vertical dimension. Actually, we can never increase the vertical dimension. We can only restore the vertical dimension which was there in the natural dentition during the patient. So that is a basic concept. You can never increase the vertical dimension more than the what patient had. You can never decrease the vertical dimension. The vertical dimension gets decreased because of the constant use of the denture, wearing of the denture. It can get more if your recording of vertical dimension is wrong but you need to restore the old vertical dimension and never alter the vertical dimension present in the patient. So pre-extraction record also plays a very important role. For example, a profile radiograph if the patient has in the lateral ceph or any other profile picture which the patient has, that will help us. Profile photographs, but that photograph should be of life size. Then all you can measure that how much was a protru protrusion, how much was a retrusion. Was the patient in skeletal class 1, class 2 or class 3 without going and opting for a radiograph. Willie's gauge. Willie's gauge is an instrument which has two like clutch like thing. So what you do with that is you keep one clutch in front of nose down submissal area and one below the chin area. Like this you keep it and without pressing it out you hold and see the measurement. So by that also you can now find out, but this is all before the extraction has taken place. Coming to articulated cast, if any adventure, 
where a patient earlier had visited to you when he or she had some natural teeth present and you had articulated that cause for some treatment at that point of time. So that will also help us in deciding the vertical dimension. Now, if the extraction has already happened, now how to go about with the vertical dimension? So the first method and the most usually method in today's day is the Niswongo's method. What we do in that method? What we do is, we take two marks, one on the tip of the nose and one on the prominent part of the chin. Now, by putting these two marks and putting the maxillary wax rim, we ask the patient to speak some words like bilabial words like mer. So, what happens? The patient goes into physiologic rest position. Because why mer takes it into physiologic rest position? Because it is the only word which is bilabial word where the teeth and the tongue has no function to play. So, that it takes the mandible to the physiologic rest position and then we can find out what is the vertical dimension at rest. Then you put both the, uh, you, now you put your mandibular wax rim. After putting the mandibular wax rim, you ask the patient to close and occlude. Once they are occluded, now again you measure the distance from the tip of the nose to that of the chin. Now these points should be constant. That is one important thing that you need to know. So now these vertical dimension at occlusion and vertical dimension at rest, when you minus and subtract it, it should have some 2.2 to 4 mm distance. And that is where it is a freeway space. This 2 to 4 mm distance of freeway space is for most compulsory for any and every kind of patient because this will keep the quality, quantity and the longevity of a denture. Not only that, it also helps in restoring the oral functions by the patient. Next was the Willis method. Willis was a scientist who gave everything with measurement and his two instruments. What he said is the distance between that of the this nose ala, to the rima oris is equal to that of rima oris to the lower chin. So if you see this half, wherever it is going half, so that much you can put your danger size. The maxillary rim will be from the base of the nose to that of the rima oris. From rima oris to here will be the another uh, rim height of the mandible. Coming to concepts of equal third, that's another beautiful concept which is now used in smile designing also. How is that concept says is the distance from the eye to that of the nose and from the nose down to that of the chin is equal third divides the entire face. So based on that, this distance is equal to this distance. So whatever will be this distance if you take it as A. And then this distance will be as B. So you can make the A equal to B. So that is how you can divide the denture and mark the denture and finalize the vertical dimension in a patient. Coming to the next one, that is Silverman's closest speaking space. Silverman was a scientist, a great scientist who came up with this concept of word S, CH. So these words were the words or the letters which while pronouncing the maxillary teeth and the mandible teeth come as close to each other but they do not touch. So what happens there is a small space of 0.75 to 1 mm left when the patient is speaking sir, sure. So our teeth is coming as close as contact to each other but not touching. So that is another physiologic space which is present and should be maintained in all patients that is called the Silverman's closer speaking space. So that is another important thing you need to mark with that and that will again decide the vertical dimension of the particular patient. Coming to the physiologic methods. Now the physiologic methods are the one which I told again the Niswonger only himself said the one method that he gave to put the mark on a chin and that of the nose was reciprocated in the physiologic rest position where he asked the patient to do certain movements. So physiological work was happening. So that method was considered into physiologic method of recording vertical dimension. Coming to phonetic method, again the same way phonetics, you ask the patient to speak different words like pound and mural word, closest speaking space words, much, or for, for. So all these things like for and word, that what happens in that the lips come in contact with each other but the teeth doesn't come. So, the, what happens, the teeth comes in closest contact to each other and doesn't come. So, these words and these letters play a very important role in determining the vertical dimension. So, you need to check that. Facial expression, of course. Facial expression is one which is the comes with an experience of a dentist. If you are after putting your denture base and your rim, maxillary and mandibular wax rim, still there are wrinkles present, still it is getting deeper, that means you can still increase your vertical dimension. If it is trotten out, the lips cannot 
competently come in close to each other. So that means your vertical dimension is more. So these are the facial expressions by which you can judge if your vertical dimension is right or wrong. Swallowing threshold. You ask the patient to swallow. So once you ask the patient to swallow, if the swallowing is difficult, that means the vertical dimension is more. If the swallowing is comfortable, the patient is feeling relaxed while swallowing. So that means your jaw sizes of the rim that you have made is exact. So you need to ask this from the patient by doing some activity, physiologic activities. Whichever is happening, those are called the physiologic methods. Tactile senses. This measurement method is another beautiful method which says, after putting your maxillary rim and your mandibular rim, you ask the patient, which you have to put it in hot water before and then place it in traverally. You ask the patient to close. Close till the patient feels all his musculatures are in tonic relaxed position. Tonic relaxed as in physiologic rest position. So when the patient feels you know, now it is in proper position, so the wax rims first get decreased, decreased, decreased and in the position where the patient feels that yes it is comfortable, the wax rim is stopped. So that position will be our proper vertical dimension. That height will be maintained by the patient using his tactile senses. Now effects of increased vertical dimension. What will happen if the vertical dimension is more? So there will be incompetent closure of the lips. There will be angular chelitis because all the time it will be in strengthened position. The swallowing will be difficult. There will be trauma. There will be freeway space will be hampered. Clicking of the teeth all the time will be there because the vertical dimension is more. So the teeth will wear off soon. The appearance of the patient will be full end appearance. The fullness of the mouth in this particular region, the fullness will be there. All the wrinkles will be as such gone, but bone resorption will highly start off. And there will be a rapid bone resorption taking place due to these increased vertical dimension. But what about decreased vertical dimension? Then also angular chelitis will occur because what will happen, these will droop inside. So they will be biting in between the teeth. So there will be angular chelitis. Your buccal mucosa will get hurt in the posterior region because that will come in between the teeth. What else will happen? The that is called the cheek biting. There will be insufficiency in mastication. The mastication will not be proper. The appearance of the patient will be very old age because all the wrinkles will appear because of the decreased vertical dimension. There will be severe pain in the temporomandibular joint region and angular chelitis of course. So this is how you are supposed to record the vertical dimension, mark the midline, mark the high lip line. You can see the two canine lines which are present and I supposedly uh, mention more to mark one line more in the molar region so that after when you are doing a centric jaw relation that is your horizontal jaw relation it is easy for us to orient back in the cast. Coming to the last part of jaw relation that is a very important, very controversial, very confusing part, horizontal jaw relation. Let's make it simple to understand. What is horizontal jaw relation? Horizontal jaw relation. Relation of the jaws in horizontal direction. How much it should be front, how much it should be back, how much it should be in contact with each other, how much overjet, how much overbite. That is what is horizontal jaw relation and that is further divided into two parts centric and eccentric. Centric is closure. Eccentric is moving your mandible towards left and right side. So centric relation and eccentric relation are the two records that you are supposed to maintain in a horizontal jaw relation. Now in eccentric also you have different like the lateral excursion movements and also the protrusive movements. This movement is also recorded. Coming to centric relation definition, the most awaited, asked, expected, coming over question all over by any examiner is centric relation definition according to GPT-8. As a prosthodontist, this definition is very fantasizing definition for everyone because this has been from years together developing from GPT-1 till now there was difference changing in the position. Earlier it was the rum position. Rum is what? Rearmost, uppermost, midmost position. Mandible, the condyle was thought to be over there. First it was thought to be in the rearmost, back position. Then it came on forward, forward and now finally in GPT-8 from 5, GPT-5 to GPT-8 there was no change in the definition except one statement. Whereas GPT-8 says this definition, it is a maxillomandibular relationship in which the condyles, it is a maxillomandibular relationship, that means it is a jaw relationship of where 
of the condyles which articulate. Condyles where do they articulate? In the thinnest avascular portion, right? So condyles articulate with the thinnest avascular portion of their respective disc. The right will articulate with the right disc, left will articulate with the left disc. With complex in the anterior superior position. That means what? It is not in the rearmost position. The condyles is in anterior superior. It is anteriorly directed and superiorly directed. It is not in the back position anymore. Thought to be. Against the shape of the articular eminence. Shape or slope. Both the statements are written. Both the words are used. So again the slope or the shape of the articular eminences. This position is independent of tooth contact. We are not supposed to speak anything about the tooth contact. Tooth may contact, tooth may not contact. That's a different story altogether. This position is discriminable in mandible when it is placed superiorly and anteriorly and restricted to purely rotatory movement. The rotation happens for first 10, 15 degree and then translation starts. So till the rotation, a pure rotation movement is happening, this position is only till that once translation is there, that means the condyle has traveled down its path from the articular eminences. So now the centriculation doesn't hold here. It only holds true when it is in purely rotatory movement and about a transverse horizontal hinge axis. So let's come again with the definition. Centric relation is defined as a maxillomandible relationship in which the condyles articulate with the thinnest avascular portion of their respective disc with complex in the anterior superior position of the artic against the shape of the or slopes of the articular eminences. This position is independent of tooth contact and this position is clinically discernible when the mandible is directed superiorly and anteriorly in a purely rotatory movement along the transverse horizontal hinge axis. This was the definition of centric relation. Now significance of centric relation. We all know that this is one position in every individual which is repeatable. Every time you ask to do patient, take the patient to the, you ask the patient to swallow back. You ask your patient to put your tip of the tongue to the posterior part of the palate. All those things when you ask the patient to do, they will take back to the centric relation. It is repeatable. It is recordable. It is a reference position from where the motion, the rotatory motion is starting off. So that is very important position and every patient has a centric relation. If you do not record the centric relation properly in a full mouth rehabilitation case or in a complete denture, the patient is going to start with severe temporomandibular joint disorders. And most important, a centric relation and a centric occlusion is slightly different. Centric relation is whatever we are speaking here happening in the condyle with that of the glenoid fossa. Centric occlusion is whatever happening with the teeth. So the position when the patient has taken the mandible to centric relation, that time whatever is your occlusion, that is called centric occlusion. Now this centric occlusion is the occlusion of the teeth when the mandible is in centric relation, right? So this is also differing from maximal intercuspation position. What is that? That is when normally I'm standing and I'm chewing it. So there is maximal intercuspation, maximum intercuspation of maxilla and mandible. Whereas the centric occlusion is that occlusion when the mandible is in the centric relation position, whatever occlusion the patient is giving, that is centric occlusion. In case of a complete denture patients, the centric relation, centric occlusion equalizes the maximal intercuspation position. Whereas in a fixed partial denture patients or the patient who has got teeth himself or herself, in those patients, what happens is the centric occlusion is not coinciding with the maximum intercuspation position. There is always a 0.2 to 0.5 mm distance present between the centric occlusion and that of the maximal intercuspation. Now that distance which can travel from centric occlusion to maximal intercuspation without change of the VD, let me repeat it, the distance that is traveled from centric occlusion to maximal intercuspation without change in the vertical dimension is called the freedom in centric. That is a centric freedom which is given in the centric in the mouth intraorally by Almighty, which a patient can travel from centric occlusion to maximal intercuspation without the changing of the vertical dimension of the face. So the various methods which were given to find out and record the centric relation positions were functional method, excursion methods, 
टैक्टाइल और इंटरक्लूजन रिकॉर्ड मेथड टर्मिनल हिंज एक्सेस मेथड फंक्शनल मेथड अगेन एज अ नेम सजेस्ट सर्स व्हाट इज इट बाय फंक्शन सो पैटरसन वाज अ साइंटिस्ट हु केम अप विद एन आईडिया इन द मैक्सिलरी रिम इन द मैक्सिलरी रिम ही अटैच फोर स्टाइली मेटल स्टाइली स्टाइली इज व्हाट अ पिन लाइक स्ट्रक्चर सो ही अटैच दो स्टाइली इन द मैक्सिलरी रिम एंड ही आस्क द पेशेंट टू मूव अकॉर्डिंग टू द मैंडिबल द मैंडिबल वाज मूविंग सो दो स्टाइली व्हिच वाज प्रेजेंट इन द मैक्सिलरी रिम वर मेकिंग सम पाथवे दैट द मैंडिबल इज मूविंग ऑन द मैंडिबुलर रिम सो वी वर गेटिंग अ डायमंड शेप्ड और अ एरो शेप्ड आर्च इन द मैंडिबुलर वैक्स रिम The next was Patterson's method. Patterson came up with a method. What he said in the mandible rim, he made a trench. Trench is like a swimming pool. We make a trench. In that trench, what he added was half plaster and half carborundum. So once he added the plaster and carborundum, and then he asked the maxillary wax rim uh, to be placed, and then mandible to be moved. So that carborundum plaster. and mixture got a shape whenever the mandible was moving that was getting molded so now the mandibular wax rim has got a shape of the way how the mandible was traveling in the eccentric positions and the centric relation positions mayer's method his method was simple enough he said let the mandibular wax rim be placed with a tin foil present on that and let the mark happen over that coming to excursive methods that is intraoral tracing and extraoral tracing that is the graphic methods now intraoral tracing and extraoral tracing these are also known as the gothic arch tracing why is that named as gothic arch tracing because in the ty gothic time the building structures if we see these were like this like arrow point markers so once we ask the mandible to move the image that you get on the plate will be somewhat like a gothic arch so that was the reason that it was named as gothic arch tracing that can be done intraorally also that can be done extraorally also if it is done extraorally the instrument name is heights tracer so tactile senses or interocclusal check record how we do that we can make the use of plaster records we can make with the help of wax we can uh, make it with the help of silicon material these days we can take the interocclusal check record close the patient's mouth and that record will be recorded in the centric relation closing the patient's mouth in centric relation guiding the mandible to centric relation is very important terminal hinge axis method that is with the help of kinematic type of phase wo when you do it that method is possible and for that you require a fully adjustable articulators so we have these methods that we spoke about the needle house method which was using four styli in the maxillary rim Patterson method, which used half carborundum and half plaster. Mayer's method, which used a tin foil over the mandibular rim. Intraoral tracers, like for example, Sibert's tracer. Extraoral tracer, for example, height tracers. These are the photographs of height tracers, and you can see there is an arrow which is present in with the mandibular tracer, where you can see those tracers have got two parts. Now this tracer device is called center bearing device. that has got two parts center bearing point and center bearing plate the center bearing plate is attached to mandible the center bearing point is attached to maxilla now the center bearing plate and the center bearing point when it is moving it has a stylus in front of the patient so it gives a mark how it is going left lateral right lateral protrusion and in centric position so the midpoint of the arrow will be the centric position the left lateral in one side right lateral in the other side so this is how it is giving like that gothic arch wala appearance that is a reason that is called gothic arch tracing those are the plaster records that are we need to do to uh, for the articulator for programming our articulator we need two records centric relation records and protrusive records in case our articulator is class 3 type 2 if our articulator is class 3 type b classification subdivision b or c where it can take the lateral records also we need to take two more records that is right lateral and left lateral records we can see in centric relation record there is a small hole present why is that hole present because in centric relation the maxilla and mandible is tightly attached whereas when you are having a protrusive motion 
we spoke before Christian chains phenomena. There's a five degree of separation. So that time there will be no hole present because the center bearing plate and the center bearing point will not touch each other in the posterior end. It will have a five degree separation. So there will be no hole in the protrusive record where there will be a hole in the centric relation record. So this is how centric relation is recorded in the patient. So entirely for a jaw relation, we record three things. Orientation jaw relation, then you record the vertical jaw relation and then finally you record the centric jaw relation and then you remove the both the wax rims together from the patient's mouth and then place it in the cast and then finally transfer it into the articulator. So this is how the jaw relation or the maxillomandibular relationship is recorded in a patient. Thank you.